Right up. of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Now he's saying, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. We, it's a privilege to be given the opportunity to suffer for the cause of Christ. Now sufferings are not fun, but it is a great honor to be given the opportunity and privilege to suffer for his sake. He says, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake. You know, he's, re he's remembering how he has persecuted the church. Now he wants to pour himself out for the church. In verse 25, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. He's cool, isn't he? The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Without the testimony of Jesus, what's the point? Prophecy is one third of the Bible. And yet many avoid it because they don't understand it. But how can you... How can you have a church that functions properly without the testimony of Jesus Christ, for heaven's sakes? You can't. In verse 26, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. This is for us, okay? The word tells us, let me show you a scripture. Let me go over here to the word admonition. Go into the A's. This is abibleconcordance.com. It's free online. And I'm going to look at admonition. Because all these things are examples to us. All these things. Okay, let me, let me snag it. Admonition. Okay. Now, 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now, all these things happened unto them. That's the children of evil through the ages in which God used them to demonstrate concepts, including his wrath. All these things happened unto them for in samples. And they are written for our admonition admonition blah 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 they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come that's us okay everything in the past was written for our admonition to teach us and to instruct us and to give us examples for our generation specifically upon whom the ends of the world are come. 
So now he says, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. See, these things have been hidden for a long time. And now they are unsealed and being revealed to us right here in this last time when the prophecies are being fulfilled. In verse 27, to whom God would make known, that's us, to whom God would make known, what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's wonderful. In verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And when it says every man, it's talking about women too. Okay, he's he is presenting all of us perfect in Christ Jesus. That's so cool. We want to be acceptable to God, don't we? We want him to be pleased with us and to uh, be glad to see us. Right. In verse 29, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. <laughs> He is so great. So see, Paul can detect the mighty workings of Christ through him. And we, we can detect those things when he comes. Just like he, you know, he, he teaches by the spirit. He teaches us by his spirit. I mean, isn't the amazement of what I just said in that sentence, if you could fully absorb it, it you just go, wow. <laughs> Let's dive into chapter two. Uh, well, before we do, let me look over here in the chat room and on Facebook and see how everybody's doing. <laughs> Everybody okay? Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, now, Natasha says she's trying to hold on to a mustard seed of faith. Well, that's all you need, sister. And he gave that to you. Not all men have faith. Hi, Ann. It's great to see you, sister. She says she's in the roughest training camp ever for such a time as this. Totally blind faith. Well, it, you know, our faith in him isn't really blind. We have plenty of reasons to believe him, don't we, sister? Um, uh, Michelle said, that makes me feel so much better that he intended my backsliding. It's, yes, he, he orchestrated it because... If you're walking with him the whole time, you're going to learn about good, but you're not going to learn about evil, okay? He has to lead you away from walking with him at some point in your life so you can learn about evil and, and about how you don't want any part of it. Um, <laughs> are you being pruned, Anne? We all are, sister. Um, well, you know what? Hang in there, Natasha. <laughs> He's coming. He is coming. Glory to his name. He's coming. Uh, that's right. No spot and wrinkle in us. He is so cool, isn't he, Denise? <laughs> Glory to his name. Uh, Natasha said, God is wonderful. I told him that in a dream. He told me he has a spot for me in heaven. He does, sister. He sure does. Hey, Crash, how you doing? Uh, welcome. Glad to see you. Now, Michelle, she had to take off. She's, um, she says she's tired. And she has to finish tomorrow after nine years of recovering from a pelvic mesh. I'm working full time. The Lord's blessed me richly. Well, glory to God. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, Michelle said she couldn't stay, but that's why, that's the beauty of, uh, of these shows being on video. See, you being uploads each show, uh, to my YouTube channel archives. I appreciate Troy doing that so much. 
And that way you can go and watch it later. And you can uh, pause it if you want to take notes and back it up if you want to hear something again. Uh, isn't uh, video recording one of the coolest things ever? It's great. Okay, let's keep going here. We're going into chapter two of the book of Colossians. And we're in verse over here. Hi, Claudia. Glory to God, sis. Great to see you. Hello, Kim. Welcome, welcome. So happy to see all of you on Facebook, too. Uh, and I'm just so happy that you're out there watching. Glory to the King. Hi, Priscilla. Hi, Mal. Hi, uh, Tony and Loretta. Uh, all of you. Welcome, welcome. Uh, let's see. Yeah. And Brian. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm just so glad all of you are here. We're going to get into Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. So he hadn't been to all the churches, but he was trying to make the rounds. In verse 2, that their hearts might be comforted. Paul wants to comfort all the saints because it's a, you know, the, the saints have been slaughtered throughout the last 2,000 years, uh, most of them by the Roman Catholic Church. And the biggest slaughter in world history is coming just ahead after our evacuation. And the Jews uh, are going to be slaughtered on a scale during the Great Tribulation that makes the Holocaust look like a kid's birthday party. Okay? It's really bad coming. But he's, Paul's telling them, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. We have fellowship with one another because we bear the same spirit. And unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. So what's he saying here? That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance. We have full assurance, <laughs> not partial assurance. We have full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. It doesn't matter if you hear it if you don't understand it, does it? You have to understand it and of the Father and of Christ. And you don't get that kind of deep teaching is not milk. That's not the the foundations of the faith. That's meat. That's filet mignon right there. In verse 3, In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In whom? In Christ. In Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And the word says in Proverbs, I think it's 2, 3, and 4, that in whom all that, well, maybe, let me see. Um, let me go over here. Well, no, okay. I'm not going to divert there. But what, it's, what it tells us in Proverbs is that Wisdom and knowledge are better than gold and silver and precious stones. Wisdom and knowledge are better than rubies. Uh, they're better than anything that you can desire. Wisdom is greater than anything you can desire on this planet or in this world, whatever you want to call it. In verse 4, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Now, isn't that what the snake in a dress, stay puffed, the, uh, the Pope does? He beguiles you with enticing words. He says, be like Jesus, but he doesn't say that Jesus is God in the flesh. 
the test of the spirits in first John chapter four tells us that if that you do the test of the spirits on them and you ask them, is Jesus Christ God in the flesh? The children of evil will not admit that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And so anyone who admits, yes, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, that's a real believer right there. That's a real child of God and not a tear. Now, if I'm not saying that those who don't know yet, and they look at you like, what? You know, but if they have a definitive answer for you and they say, no, he's not God in the flesh, that they don't, they fail the test of the spirits and you might as well just get rid of them, get them out of your life because they're, they fail the test of the spirits. Okay. They could be a tear, but at the very minimum, they're bad news. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. That's what the Pope does. He, be, he will tell you, be like Jesus, do the works of Jesus, do this like Jesus, do that like Jesus, but he will never say that Jesus Christ is God Almighty in a flesh body. But Jesus said he was. <laughs> The test of the spirits, learn it, love it, live it, use it, okay? In verse 5, for though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. So we're all on the same team. And when any of us succeed, all of us, should rejoice because any success with any member of the body of Christ is a, is a success for the body as a whole. In verse six, as have, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. He's saying you, you know, you, you acknowledge him as your Lord and savior, listen to his word and obey it. Don't just be a hearer of the word, be a doer of the word. In verse seven, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. So you're rooted and built up in him, not in yourself and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So as the Lord teaches you and you're like, wow, and you're learning and it, you're just feeling so happy that he's teaching you and you have, you're finally coming out of that bondage where they make you scared to death to die all the time when false religion, then you feel this great relief because you have the assurance and you know you're not in trouble with God and that makes all the difference in whether you want to hide under the table or whether you're like, Father, Abba, Father. So abounding therein with thanksgiving. In verse 8, beware lest any man spoil you. That means take your crown through philosophy and vain deceit, telling you, that Jesus Christ isn't God in the flesh. Well, don't believe that. You don't believe that or they can take your crown. They can't take your salvation, but they can take your crown. The word says in the spirit, in the revelation, uh, in the letters to the churches, let no man take your crown. You learn the word yourself. Instead of believing what some clergyman or priest tells you when he's probably never even picked up a Bible for more than five minutes. Now he says, lest any man spoil you. That means steal from you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men. See, that's what Jesus was complaining about to the wicked religious leaders. He was saying, you take your traditions and you make them a, and you subvert the word of God in favor of your traditions. That's a no-no. 
after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. In verse 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now that says it all, doesn't it? That says Jesus Christ is the invisible father outside the body. He is the son of God inside the body. And he is the spirit of God who communicates with us and who is the earnest of our salvation already being given us as a deposit. So we have assurance. And that is our assurance. Because when the Holy Spirit dwells in you, you are not going to hell or else he's got to go with you. And that's not going to happen. But notice that. For in him, Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness. That means all three persons of the Godhead. Dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now that means Jesus Christ is God in a human body. He is God in the flesh. That's what that means. And those who cannot receive that, you know, uh, they fail the test of the spirits. In verse 10, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. And ye are complete in him. There's nothing lacking in you while you're in him. There's nothing lacking in you. And this world will tell you everything is lacking in you, but that's not true. The word says, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. He is the head of all principality and power. He's in charge. And nothing, no evil angel and no good angel, no wicked spirit, no good spirit, no child of evil, no child of God makes a single move or takes a single breath without his express design and permission and authority, okay? In verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. This is the circumcision of the heart where you give yourself totally to him okay in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of christ circumcision of the law is the cutting of the foreskin the circumcision of the heart is giving him you giving him your life surrendering to his authority in verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Now, baptism is a symbolic thing, okay? It's not required for salvation. It's not a condition of salvation. Remember the thief on the cross? He wasn't baptized. But it is important to get baptized because it's an instruction to you to do so. And in that process, you are learning through that demonstration what you're doing. As you go under the water, you are participating willingly in his death. And as you come back out of the water, that is representative of the resurrection, newness of life. So you take the old person and you get baptized. You go under the water and that person dies in Jesus. The person that you are that's part of the world dies in Jesus. Now, it's not that it happens right then, but it's symbolic so you can understand it. See, it happened before you were born. But... That's symbolic, your baptism. You're participating in his death and in his resurrection as you come back up out of the water. Now, he says, in verse 12, buried with him in baptism. We'll come back. 
we'll come back and we'll start again at Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Right up.